in the 21st chapter of Revelation, the same thing is said that Isaiah said 700 years earlier. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. When Isaiah had that revelation, it is assumed by the readers of the Bible that it then happened 700 years later to John. But that isn't the case. It happened when Isaiah saw it. And John simply came to the attention of the public 700 years later. Time was never any different for Isaiah than it is for us. The only difference being that he was out of time when he saw it and when he said it. And it was, he was reporting what was current then out of time. It just came to our attention 700 years later. That's what a prophet is. Someone who's in the now, seeing what is in the now. And then we who live in time, seeing it not in the now, see it as many years later as we do see it. Jesus Christ was on the earth when he made this statement. And when he made the statement, he had attained awareness of something that the earth could not contain. He had seen through the illusion, he lived in the reality. He lived in the new heaven, which was new only to those who hadn't seen it, which means that man thought a new heaven had been discovered. But it was the living place, the abode of those who had found the Father before. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. This was the appearance to John. When new consciousness takes over, we are wedded to the bride. The soul meets the bride. The spirit and the bride, the spirit and the soul are wedded. In this new consciousness, all of the hopes and plans and dreams and statements in the Bible become a fact. We are reunited with the universe of God. We are out of the mortal dream. We are in immortality, 
in life which has no ending. This is the breakup of the illusion for us, as it was for Christ Jesus, as it was later for John. It is our hope of glory to be in that breakup of the illusion. A while ago, we had another illusion on this island. It would seem that the world was tossed around, the land was devastated, some lives were lost, everyone was in a state of turmoil. How many recognize an illusion, I don't know. And then in my hometown, in Kauai, the same thing. Another state of illusion. Hundred and fifty mile winds devastated the city. We don't even know what's happening there. But we do know one thing. Only God is there. Those wandering in the illusion of human life, as most of us had for centuries, suddenly could be transported if they were where John is. But they're worried about the material things of life, they're worried about their children, their husbands, their families. Very few are aware that they are looking at the dream world being dismantled. It's difficult in the midst of such confusion to know that you're in the midst of a dream. Sometimes the dream is smooth, sometimes it's rough, but it's always a dream. And in a sense, I feel that in a manner, we are being prepared for the change in consciousness. Just as you see the difficult times when food doesn't come to an island or Food doesn't come to a city. Thousands are homeless. Relief flown in. Ninety people couldn't get off our island without aid. Hospitals were emptied, moved to another city. We are going through the same thing in this world of reality. In what we think is reality, we are learning that things cannot be controlled. There's nothing you can do about it. Suddenly the ground is ripped up. The air is alive with tension. And you are called upon to know that this is your sense illusion. Whether it's smooth or rough, And it hits you strongly that this is only a preparation because when you have overcome this sense illusion, you've much further to go. After you put your house back in order, you get your insurance paid off, you get the faucets working, you get the phone company installing this and that. You're right in the same illusion anyway. It's just that it's a little more convenient. But if you know you're in the illusion, then you're prepared to come out of the illusion. As John is prepared in this 21st chapter, he didn't have to have 
the world thrown up around him, confusion in the air, people in pain. He suddenly was brought to the point of utter visibility, seeing past the whole human illusion to a new earth and a new heaven, and his feet were still planted on this earth. That is the point of it. While your feet are still planted on the earth, you won't be seeing the kind of an illusion that comes with wind blowing, things flying through the air. You'll see an illusion that everyone thinks is normal, but you won't. And there will be a day when you will emerge from that illusion, when you can almost feel your possible emergence. And suddenly it's lifted. The illusion for you is not there. You have come into a new state of being. You don't see flesh. You're looking straight at what once was flesh, but you don't see it. Your new vision cannot comprehend or see flesh. Your senses don't record flesh. Your senses don't record anything in the universe that you once were there in a universe that could give you something or take from you. You don't find anything like that. Your new level of perception cannot see weather. Your new level of perception cannot see people. You're looking straight at them as you once did, but you cannot see their form. You have been lifted into incorporeality. And I know that we have not been lifted into incorporeality at this date. But if we can believe God and Jesus, we're going to be lifted into incorporeality. There's no point of this demonstration which has taken 250,000 years to get to our attention. There's no point of that demonstration if it's not meant to be. And I, for one, look forward to the day when we are looking at the world and there are no oceans. It says here, there, there's no sun in the sky, there's no need of a moon. And there isn't any, it says, in this chapter. Can you imagine looking at the sun and the moon and it isn't there? You can't see it. Because it never was there except to human beings. Well, this is the far out that we're coming to. And maybe you say, well, that's so far away, why do we talk about it now? If you think it's far away, it will be. If you think it's close for you or someone you know, chances are it will be. I know when Joel left this plane, it was very close to Joel. And when others who have been enlightened have left this plane, it was very close to them. When they were on this plane, they could see what was in store for them. 
And it's hard to realize that the world has come to a place where it's no longer something to read about in a book. It's something that's happening right outside on your doorstep. It's coming to that. Otherwise, God has been saying a lot of things in the Bible that you have not heard. It's clear from what we have seen that you and I have been preparing, carefully preparing. In every incarnation, we continue that preparation. We are preparing for the day when the fourth world, which is the day of man and woman, is no more. And when man and woman are seen in their true light, and many will walk this earth seeing man and woman as other men and women won't see them. You'll walk right past an individual who is seeing man and woman a different way, and he will not be visible to you. Maybe you didn't think you'd come to that day, but you're coming to it swiftly. We live in a world that is changing rapidly, and the changes are only in the illusion. The truth is becoming visible and tangible to those who are in the truth. And the speed of it is so swift that it really makes your head swim. Now, I'd like you to feel that you're in the tempo, you're in the flow. You're not sitting still and idle and wondering about what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. And you know it comes suddenly. You know it's nothing but a deep joy because it happens quickly. And it happens to an individual and then another individual. It doesn't come in groups. Each individual finds himself lifted. And now is the time to be ready, to be ready to see with the inner eye when it happens. It's nothing you control. You don't press a button, but you look out and you see reality. The child of God sees reality. And it doesn't look like the things we are looking at. There's a lot of passages in here about the, the 12 stones. The first thing that happens is you see the jacinth. What it amounts to is that the world becomes a transparency. You're looking at a world and now it's not there because it's transparent to you. It didn't go anywhere. You just see right through it. Your vision is developed to that level where you can see through the world. It's hard to imagine but you may as well know that is what you're going to do. You look right through flesh, you look right through steel, you look through anything in the world. And that's what Jesus did, the Christ. You can have a sense of deep gratitude for the you that you are, even though you don't appear to be that yet. Because someday you will look at things that you cannot see right now, and you'll look right through them at things that you will see. 
and you will understand why the Bible has been telling us that we are as perfect as God. There aren't any men or women in the fifth world. That may be a great loss to you, it may not. But they're only sons of God. And we never talk like this because we're in the learning stages, going up, learning, learning, learning. But we're getting close to the fruition. And it may take quite some time, maybe uh, in your illusory world, you'll call it a thousand years. Maybe in your illusory world, it'll be a hundred years or 5,000 years. But in truth, there will be no years. It won't be 100 or 1,000 or 5,000. It'll be reality attained. Illusion re left behind. And I think it's so close that we talk about it now, although we haven't before. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is the end of separation. Whereas there was always a wall between you and God, or a seeming wall. God was always somewhere else, either far away or near but not visible, not tangible. The wall is taken away. Separation is taken away. Do you know what it means? What happens when separation is taken away? You may think of it as blasphemy. What happens when I and the Father are one? Not two, one. Can you be one with God and still be a separate person? Does that mean you are God? Does that mean I and the Father are one? Or does it mean the Father is greater than I. We see Christ in the form of Jesus, and we think God is somewhere else. That would be two, wouldn't it? We, see, we say the Son of God. How would it be if you said, he is God, and he is God, and he is God? And how can there be a God and a Son if God is one? Do you understand your position a little better? That God is one. And when you see the new heaven and the new earth, you will realize that God is one. 
the God you have been searching for all your life is all there is. Where does that leave a you? Each of us is the God of heaven. There's no separation. Each is God's son at this point. But as we rise in consciousness, each of us is equal with God. What does that mean? It means that we are one being. But if you are equal with God and I am equal with God and she is equal with God, and equal with God means we are one being, are we separate people? Are you and I separate? If we're equal with God, we're equal with each other. So what has happened? In this 21st chapter, John has realized no form. No form. Formless. And the word for that is incorporeality. He has realized the incorporeal nature of man. Where you have no form and you are one with the Father. And all that I have is thine. Can you see that you are much more than you anticipated? When we attain this level, and it seeps into our memory, and wherever we go, we don't lose that knowledge. If I am one with God, how can I act other than Godlike? How can one who is one with God say, I feel sick, or I'm going to die, anything negative? He wouldn't be one with God, would he? And if he is so one with God that it's impossible to even think these things, let alone say them, can you imagine in your reality being of a nature that you cannot deny God because you'd be denying yourself? And yet, God's perfection is our perfection. And knowing this, because it's quite clear that it's true, why on a lower level would we tolerate imperfection there? when we know at the highest level there's no imperfection possible. Why would we tolerate imperfection? Some say, well, we don't want to tolerate it, it just takes off by itself. It doesn't quite take off by itself. It needs someone who will permit it to take off by itself. someone who gives quiet consent or is defeated before he starts. I am one with God and that covers every level of my being. It's worth fighting for to grimly know that I am one with God and I stand on that fact in the quiet of my being and the realization will come to me. I and the Father are one. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father. It 
is not blasphemy. It is truth. We're not talking about this one who has negative thoughts about this, other thoughts that he or she is ashamed of. We're talking about the child of God who has overcome all of the human traits that are the negative thoughts. So let us stand up now and understand that I stand on my divine self. It is my understanding that I am divine. And I'm not going to go against my understanding and start being undivine. I'm not going to slit this fellow's throat. It's not my nature. I'm divine. Thoughts will not even cross your mind after a while. When you know you're divine, you will act divine. And you know that means a lot of change. can't get mad at your neighbor and oh everything is ruled out you just you live a divine life and that's all there is to it if you're only 99% you've still got to live a divine life and find that other 1% I think we're being challenged look at my life it must be divine because I am the image and likeness of my father And if it is divine, and I allow something non-divine to happen, well, that's as bad as a, a child in school uh, hiding his, his friend's notebook or talking behind the teacher's back. We are divine and we're going to act it consciously. We acted through every circumstance. Now, maybe the other fellow doesn't act divine. He comes over and he blacks your eyes and he steals your wallet. Or maybe he puts a knife in you. But you can see through the illusion, can't you? It hurts, but that's an illusion. In short, being divine, being Christ, is your protection, if protection is necessary, against anything, anyone. You simply are what you are. There's nothing in your life that can be detrimental to you because your life is the life of God. In our true reality, we are living the life of God. And this is what happens when there's a new earth and a new heaven. The life I was living, the mortal life, is no more. I'm now living the life of God. Of course, that new heaven, new earth, seems far off. We haven't reached that consciousness. But it isn't mentioned because it is unattainable. It's mentioned because it's inevitable. And it's advisable to think about it, to prepare, to know when it happens, I am prepared. and to work for the happening. The Bible is becoming clearer and clearer. It's a statement of ultimate truth. And we who know to some degree what it is saying and why would be foolish if we turned away and acted differently. 
because our ultimate freedom lies in our knowing the truth of the Bible within us as well as in the Bible so let's examine a few more thoughts that he gives us that sat upon the throne said behold I make all things new and he said unto me right these words are true and faithful presume that this had been in your consciousness that the divine voice had said right because these words are true and faithful could you contain yourself would you doubt them would you not quiver just in trying to reach for a pen to put it down and what would you do if you heard it everything which John has put in this paragraph what would you do if you had heard it what did he do to receive the words from this invisible source called God to see the things he saw to feel the rightness of them he could never be a a human being he could hardly be seen by one person on the earth and here he was receiving words from the lips of God <coughs> and knowing I am standing on the threshold of a new age an invisible civilization peopled by sons of God there are no things there's nothing in this world that can age nothing ages out of the world there's no age there's no one today who's older than yesterday or younger there's no getting older there's no age it doesn't exist you can be a hundred years old or two thousand years old or five million years old you won't change your appearance and your calendar doesn't show any increase in age you are a spiritual being we live in this magnificent invisible universe
Then he speaks about Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, a new city. which had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. That lamb is within you. Can you imagine that the light of a city could come from that which shines from you, it will because that light is the Christ light. And that which is within you is you. And that's all there is of you. And the Christ light at this point is free to shine without any obstruction. The fullness of your light is greater than the light of the sun. The sun must disappear because your light is too bright. And yet we look at it now, we can't find it. Maybe we find a touch of it in your eyes a touch of it in the way you walk, something about your manner. But we don't, we don't even see a thimble full of light compared to what is. When the light of a city is the light of Christ in you and you and you, Our light is superior to the light of the sun. Do you wonder about that, how that can be? That's what we are being prepared for. We won't be blinded by it. Our own light won't blind us. We won't have little eyes to look out where that could be blind. Wherever we go, we are the light which lights everything around us. Can you see any diseases in this light? When doctors in the world are given their right eye right now to get a light of that boldness into the world, that light makes disease impossible. The very light of your being makes disease impossible. It also makes all the things that you try to accomplish disappear in the light because they've all been accomplished. Everything you could possibly want to do, you've done. The light of you is the perfection of the domain of the Father. The universal light of you is impossible for anything to be wrong in that light. There's no place where anything can stand to be wrong. Everything is the perfect light of the Father. 
That's who we are. And to live up to it while in the flesh is difficult. But as we determine ourselves to be better and better and better, we find strange, wonderful things are happening. And that's because more of the light is getting through. You can't have a sore foot in the light. And so Jesus looks at a person, oh, you were crippled. Of course, in the Christ light, you can't be a cripple. So you're not a cripple. The light is the savior. The Christ light shines in the midst of you and it brings the miracle of Christ to everything you do, say, and think. We'll see children in the new light. We'll see that they are the light as well as we are. Let's find the, not the center, but the glorious center. Let's stand there. Let your light shine. Let no thought cast a shadow. And try to experience the consciousness of John. He has received communication from on high he feels the responsibility of communicating it to man. How does he record what he has to teach? What gives him the deep impulse to record it? To expand it into the people of the world. I'd like you to sort of put yourself in his shoes. See that you are John. You know that what is coming to you from the inner spirit is priceless. Possibly the inner spirit also says, I want you to share this with the men and women who go to their churches in the mornings, go to their businesses in the daytime, who teach their children I want you to take my word and bring it out into this very limited consciousness that is called man. And the year is now, oh, about 92. I want you to take it over to the church and leave it with them let them see what I have told to you and then you John you take it to the church and the elders meet and they look at it they say what is this where did this come from You don't defend yourself. It says where it came from. 
And they look at it and they say, well, this is obviously a forgery. In the first place, how could you be John? Well, he lived at the time of Jesus. What are you, a hundred years old? You're a fraud. Secondly, we don't think that there's any good purpose behind this. You're trying to split religion. Now, we're bringing news to the public that they obey all the words of God. We can't see that this is anything but a plagiarism by a man who is ungodly. And that's what the revelation of St. John meant to the church at that time, the early church. They were all steeped in their personal opinions of what ought to be. And John, having left this incredible legacy, was the only man on earth who had it because Jesus now was living in Christ consciousness, not in this world. And it took almost 400 years, I think it was 392 B.C. before John's message was accepted and actually made a part of the Bible in 392 or thereabouts. I think it was 392. And it was in that year that the revelation of St. John became a Bible. It was accepted into the Bible. And you know, it was hardly ever looked at. How many people could understand it? They'd look at the words and it seemed like God was constantly chastising somebody. You couldn't expect people to follow it, to do what it told them, because it didn't tell them very much. It was all in a certain kind of a language that had to be interpreted. And so it was 700, 1700 before Bibles were out, up to 1600, they didn't have any printing presses. Bibles were out in 16 something, and then in the 1700 they were out in more abundance. And actually by the 18th century, the Bible just got into print. And if you were living up to then, you didn't get a chance to see a Bible. You got something that was written out by a couple of men who made it their profession to write out the Bible. And you got it in your home. It stood high. You had to put it in a closet. You had to dust it off when it came out. You read it and you obeyed just as if you were a child. It said this, and you did this. It said that, and you did that. And if you didn't understand what it was saying, you couldn't do this and that. And that went into, even into the 19th century, there were not many translations of the Revelation. And when they came out, a few here and there, I made a study of them, and I can tell you that some of them were ludicrous. They were, you know, we do this because it says we do this. They were very literal. And the last thing that they wanted in the revelation of John was a literal translation. He had given us what the Master had given him. The Revelation of St. John was written 
not by a person, but it was communicated by the Christ, the Christ of Jesus, to the Christ of John. And the one who had left the earth was now replaced by John who had remained on earth. And he was bringing the word of God direct from Jesus to the earth. And when you read about man in there, about what man is expected to do, it took a long type, certain type of reading to understand that he was speaking about spiritual man, not about physical man. And as a result, the world, the world, not a country, the world knows very little about spiritual man. Oh, there are some enlightened here and some enlightened there, and how grateful we are. But there aren't many Buddhas. There aren't many Johns and there aren't many Jesus. Jesuses. There's Lao Tzu. You can name. It would take quite quite a tussle if you could name 100 who know the revelation of St. John. I think you might run out of names before you got to that 100. And so the world is unaware of the divine activity that went into making the revelation public. And when a person gets that and reads it and in all honesty he tries his best to follow it and can't, the word of God is wasted. But then you say to yourself, well, maybe it isn't time. It just wasn't time, and it isn't now, for God's word to be in the world. But then you go into certain movements who study the Bible, study the Revelation, and the word is again interpreted. Maybe to some it's limited to a few in that teaching who know it. You can be sure that the mass of the public who is studying religion, the religious public, is not aware of the meaning of St. John's revelation. And that is why it is so important for us to see that in the midst of the universe of people, there is a hidden statement of truth, and that no matter how difficult it is to learn, that statement of truth must be seen not in its literal way, because we are hopeful that in finding the solution to what the statements are in the Revelation, we see that our spiritual life is being released. We are being released from the narrow concept of a God in heaven to the spiritual realization of a God within me, of a God within you, and finally to the realization that there is no me and no you. We are learning that God is all. And because God is all, 
that must be your nature. That must be my nature. How can God be all and I be something else? I must be what God is. So St. Paul, revealing that we are equal with God, had discovered 200, 2,000 years ago that God is the life of every human being and therefore no human being is human but conceals within himself the identity of God, the Christ, the one divine reality in the universe and beside which there is none other. There is no man. There is no woman. There is no human activity. There is only God. And each of us has the opportunity to be that God. You must completely release yourself into the spirit which is the activity of God on earth and you must expect the wonder of spirit to permeate your life each of us has that responsibility to reproduce where I am the living quality of God the will of God the perfection of God, the knowledge of God. We have never, never seen an individual who fully accepts that responsibility unless we have seen one who in accepting it has risen to the point of mastership and has distinguished himself for fidelity not to the word not to the dead word but to the living spirit I am talking because I expect that each of us has one desire to fulfill God's will and that will is that you be God. If that is your will then the will of God in you is living itself and you will fulfill that will by moving higher in realization nothing can stop you when we were given the opportunity to study with Joel we were being told that God has sent this man and we are privileged to receive God's word brought to us at the level of our understanding by another so-called man. He has left a legacy of truth you cannot read a Joel Goldsmith book without being exposed to perfect truth. He was faithful. His work reflected every principle as taught by the Christ because he was the Christ. 
and you will follow his principles and enact them because you are the Christ. We are keeping the circle of Christ open for each one who finds the ability to say, I am the Christ of God. I can do nothing except the Christ message, except the Christ life. I must live that way. I must lead my friends and relatives that way. And I must not lead them by words, but by what I do. My actions must be Christ actions, so that they in turn, viewing me, will know that I live not by human will. Christ really liveth your life. We'll find the ability to be faithful to that thoroughly. Many people come to this desk. It's quite clear that they're living the Christ life. Even when they find a few problems in their life, you can feel the truth as if they were saying to you, what I feel and think is as close to Christ as I can come. If I can come any closer, I want Christ to lead me to it. You feel this about them. They are bringing the Christ message to this earth. They literally are. And we may find that we're in dangers from human activities, but if we are faithful to the Christ message, there is never a danger on this earth. even if we're taken from the earth. We are still the Christ. And the message of Christ being true can only evolve into outer activity which produces Christ activity. And you're living in the kingdom of heaven on earth now. Instead of a constitution and laws, you have an inner Christ record of what you are expected to do and know. And as you live that out, the Christ becomes more important than legal law. Each of us is constituted a body of Christ so that where we go all that Christ involves, all is present where you are. Every Bible, everything written in the Bible, every tenet of the Bible is present where you are always. If you are living the Christ life, And that means God is present everywhere you are consciously and everywhere you are not conscious. God is present in every inch of space 
in every ounce of spirit. God is present where the illusion appears, and you, knowing this, are always able to say to the Father, I know your presence is here, where I am. in your presence is fulfillment. I am constantly fulfilled by your presence. Though I know it not, though I see it not, and the world knows it not. So we'll spend our time, oh, it doesn't take but a half hour to establish a little closer Christ consciousness. You get into it. You know you're going to stay there regardless of what comes your way. And ultimately you attain the ability to do that. You can shrug off anything that is ungodly. You can make your inner correction and realize when you make the inner correction, it isn't for six foot around you. It's for wherever your consciousness is. And it's everywhere. You are Christ not only in your home, but your city, your country, your universe. You have no limitations in size and space. Wherever you go, you are the embodiment of Christ. Now the texture of this world is rather difficult to follow. Certain things are unexpected, some things are known and expected, but you are observing and feeling the presence of everything as the Christ, and it's not coming to you that way. It's not broken up so you can identify it, but the Christ feeling of rightness, of truth, of liberty, of peace, you look at everything with this Christ feeling, and it doesn't measure up to what you are feeling should be there. And that which you're looking at is not being seen correctly. Make your inner adjustment so that everything is interpreted from the invisible and broken down into it's Christ components. And then you'll see it differently. Make that the center of your consciousness. Christ is the center of my consciousness. Christ is the perimeter of my consciousness. Everything is viewed from the Christ viewpoint. It's as if anyone were to touch you, they not only would be touching Christ, they'd be influenced by what they touch.
and yet you're not a visible being. You've got to bridge the gap between your invisibility and your visibility. Your invisible self will never stop being Christ. And what you've got to do is to develop that capacity to bring your visible self into more of your invisible. So that someone can stop you on a street and be influenced by the living Christ. It may get boring for some people to be dwelling on one subject as if their life is composed of that subject. But the more you dwell in the Christ, the more you discover that its influence is in every level of your life when you permit it to be. And it releases you from that which denies the presence of perfection at all times. With no rehearsal, you can know that what I am into now must be perfect because Christ is. That becomes your way of life. You are in perfection. You are in living, understanding, bringing, being, perfection. That's your religion, perfection. Perfection invisibly and visibly. Everyone has a child or someone who depends on them for higher vision. Why don't we make an effort to bring our Christhood into that child and that child into his Christhood or her Christhood? Why don't we make it a point to spend a little less time being human and a little more time living in the Christ so that the child may benefit by our example? I know how we cater to children. Now we think, well, he's too young to understand. I don't think anyone is too young to understand. There was a 12-year-old who understood very well, so much that his elders were befuddled by his intelligence because he spoke the words of the Christ. I think we have an opportunity wherever we go to be a Christ influence. Not by saying I'm Christ and you're Christ. By what we do, what we say, what we think. And if you find that this light's a, a light in you, make use of it. I don't uh, mean to go out and say to every child who comes into your scope, now do this and do that, and do it the Christ way. I'm talking about setting an example without being obvious. 
So a child finds he's unconsciously following the Christ through you. So this is a definitely personal appeal. That Christ isn't only something we draw to ourselves, it's something we share with others. We want a Christ world. And if our ambition gets the best of us, it's a good ambition. Christ wants a Christ world. We have no right to pass by. I'd like each of us to see what it's like to be the Christ influence where we are. Whether it's home or business. And not be obvious about it. No labels, no saying, I'm Christ. It's what you do that counts. You don't slough when there's a chance to perform. In the office, you don't let something drag when you have to do it. In the home, you find you don't say, well, I'm too tired, I won't do that, I won't do this. You're always the Christ. It's all right to take a nap. The point is that whatever you do, you do with the knowledge that I, the invisible Christ, I'm always here. I would like to look at the father-son relationship for a minute. The father who has a son and doesn't know how to get across what he wants to get across to the son. Very puzzling, very frustrating. But he wants his son to be without fear. He wants his son to know where he's going and why. And above all, he doesn't want his son to realize or think that his father is one without a purpose in life. How would father go about teaching son without interfering in the boy's life. If he's waited too long, he's got an adult on his hands. And it's a different story. Let's say the boy is 16. That's probably too late. He's got to start a little earlier and inculcate qualities that his son should have as the Christ. Maybe he could decide on five qualities. What would they be?
How about fidelity to truth, number one? Truth is self-understood. This is true or it's not. If it's true, I'm faithful to it. How about fidelity to certain types of truth? Fidelity to types of truth that go deeper than just the usual truth and integrity. Integrity to complete what I start. Integrity to live up to my promises when possible. Certain qualities that you know all border around the integrity. And the boy should be taught that it's better to admit a lack of integrity than to go on and not practice it. That he's got to live with integrity in this world. He's got to be recognized as one who has it. That will descend quietly. It will overflow into something else later. You're building little qualities that will become spiritual qualities later. Now, does Christ lie? I don't know of anyone who can say that Christ lies. You may not understand him at times, but he didn't say Christ lies. We do. But if a boy is trained that Christ never lies, you can't lie and be the Christ. Maybe you're not teaching him to be the Christ yet, but you've got to get across the point that whoever he is thinking of himself to be, to be right with his fellow man, simply cannot lie. That will become a Christ quality later. Now you say, I don't have time for all this. I say, you do have time. You have time to prevent your son from living the unchrist life. So you'll find the time. And you can think of certain qualities he has to have that would make it impossible for him to do many of the things that are being done which are a complete reversal of how a child should live. You won't want to teach him to speak his mind, but you should. He can learn to speak his mind without being an upstart. And you must teach him to speak his mind where you're concerned as well. You'd be surprised what many of our children think that they're afraid to tell their mothers and dads. But if they are taught that they must speak their mind, say what they feel, good or bad, you'll find you have a different child than you anticipated. You may find several things that are quite 
annoying to have known. But they must speak their mind to you and tell you what they feel. That is something that must be allowed purposely. Because when you know the child's mind, then he will always speak what he feels. In the long run, what he feels about you, you will know enough to change what he feels if you must change. And if there is something in your life that you've been hiding from someone, you won't hide it any longer. Truth is a, a weapon, a glorious weapon. Well, you can go down the list, establish five qualities. And give the child a chance to express. But what you're aiming at is to establish in him the qualities that will enable him to feel free as he grows into his puberty to feel free to express himself the way he has learned he must learn to express himself not to be timid about it not to be overbearing we're teaching human qualities with the knowledge that we're going to convert these human qualities into the spiritual self because you can train anyone from untruth to truth anyone from lack of liberty to liberty to giving others the liberty to have their liberty you're making a real spiritual citizen out of him and if you do this you'll find that you are benefiting yourself because you'll have to brush up on what you're going to do with your child and as you do you find that something was neglected in you. You find father and son, mother and son, when they are lifted to the level of helping each other this way, will find that they have many things to do that are an improvement to themselves. I'm not trying to make us into disciplinarians who insist on our way but spiritual beings who are bringing the spirit to the young and as we start this in our life it carries over to us and we are finding that we have become more spiritual through teaching the spirit to our children Many grandmothers have this opportunity. I've digressed a bit. What I try to get across, though, is that all of our life is spiritual, not just some part of it. You don't hide in a bedroom and do your meditations and then come out and be a human being that's not spirit your spirit is your name your being and wherever you are you are still that spirit you've got to learn how to express yourself spiritually at all times I think more good can be accomplished by trying to be the spirit of God to live the spirit to say what the spirit would say to be responsive to the spirit within more good can come from that effort Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into our channel. If you're enjoying the content, don't forget to hit that like button below. It really helps us out. And why not share this video with your friends? Spread the word and help us reach more people. 
Lastly, make sure to subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications so you never miss a new video from us. Thanks for watching and see you next time.